Hey there, welcome to this special online experience. Whether you heard our Sunday message already or you're hearing it today for the first time, I know that it's going to bless your life. So go ahead and check this out. This is the last installment of this series that we have titled, What Time Is It? In week one, I told you that more than just being your pastor, a part of me feels like I'm a wedding planner and I'm getting the bride of Jesus ready for our wedding. So today I thought that I would come dress like a wedding planner. You know, I have on in the month of December, one of the happiest days of my life. I know I speak for my wife as well. We celebrated the wedding of our beautiful daughter, Alyssa, with her husband, Miles. And, and uh, let me tell you something. I was a hot mess that day. Yes, I was. I was a hot mess, man. For all you fathers that have multiple daughters, peace be upon you. Like, I don't want to deal with that again. I'm glad that I just have one. I mean, it was just, but, but today I have the same suit that I was wearing on that day. I even got the same tie, y'all. So when you open this suit, it says, Ali's dad. Come on, somebody, because that's, yeah. So I wanted to close out this teaching series speaking on the theme, preparing for the wedding. Preparing for the wedding. Can we pray and ready our hearts to hear God's word? Man, I feel in a sense a spirit of expectation. Let us pray. Father, we come before you today. Our hearts are pressing in. Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, speak to all of our friends that are online, our online campus, Lord. Beyond this space, Lord, I pray that you would touch them draw unto you all those that would be saved and we'll give you all the honor and all the glory for you are worthy of all our praise and everybody said amen come on let's put our hands together welcome welcome in our online campus we love you guys thank you for being a part of what God is doing here in Springfield Massachusetts go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 19 I want to start here verse 7 look at what the Bible says let us Rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Now I want you to notice the expectation for this wedding. The expectation and the posture is that the church ought to rejoice. The church ought to be glad. The church ought ought to have a spirit of praise giving him glory because it is a promise. Now week one I told you that the book of Revelation, often people get intimidated by it. They feel just all sorts of different uh, raw emotions when it comes to it. But when we talk about the end times, we've learned that it's not a horror story. It's a love story. Jesus is coming back for his church. So what is this sermon all about? What is this series all about? It's a love story. He made you a promise. He's making room for you. He's coming back. I'm going to say that again. It's a love story. He made you a promise. He's making room for you. He's coming back. So what I'm going to try to do over the next several minutes, I'm going to try to summarize the entire book of Revelations. That's right. Yeah, I'm just going to give you the... A little bullet point and then you can, you can study it more uh, with your own time. But, but I believe that after this teaching, you will know a little bit more about the book of Revelation than you did today. Let's pick it up in Revelation chapter 1. It shows us the purpose of this book. The revelation of Jesus Christ. So what is this the revelation of? Jesus Christ. All right? There's a lot of symbolism. But this is highlighting the person of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servant the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Verse 3, blessed is the one who reads it. Now, notice it doesn't say scared. Scared is the man who reads it. No, it says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And again, it doesn't say scared. It says, blessed are those who hear. So this is what the Lord is saying. 
If you're reading the book of Revelation, you're blessed. If you're hearing a sermon about the book of Revelation, you're blessed. So I want to welcome you today to the blessed atmosphere that is Restoration City, because that's what the Bible says. Blessed are those who hear it and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So we're not scared. We're not afraid. It's not a horror story. It's a love story. He made us a promise. He's coming back for his church. So, Pastor, where do we find that promise? Well, turn back to the Gospel of John. Look at what the Gospel of John tells us. Chapter 14, verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. This is what Jesus is saying to, to his disciples. Hey, listen, I know you're hearing about the end times and how... All sorts of things are going to happen, but don't get scared. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And then he tells him, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? So good. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Say it with me. It's not a horror story. It's a love story. He made us a promise. He's making room for us. He's coming back. Come on, let's now say like you had breakfast. It's not a horror story. It's a love story. He made us a promise. He's making room for us. He's coming back. Come on, church. Y'all sound great. Give him a hand. That's true. So let me give you a quick summary of the entire book of Revelation. You ready? Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we deal with the church age. And I'm going to end my teaching today spending a lot of time speaking about the church age. Then in Revelation chapter 4, you find the rapture of the church. Right, this is the rapture of the church. Jesus made us a promise. He's coming back for his church. And we will be caught up, as the Bible says, in Thessalonians. And then in Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 19, you have a picture of the tribulation period. It will be three and a half years of peace and prosperity upon the earth and unity. And then the latter part of the great tribulation will be God's judgment and God's wrath upon earth. Now, y'all don't have to worry about it because the church is not here because it's not a horror story. It's a love story. He made us a promise. He's making room for us. He's coming back. So the church does not go through the tribulation period. We go in the first elevator. Come on, somebody. Like, I know some people have that theology, well, you know, if I, if I don't go in the first elevator, then, you know, I just, you know, I have them, you know, chop off my head and I'll stay in the second. Boy, you cry through a paper cut, talking about no chopping heads off and all that. Man, I'm not worried about that. I'm going in the first elevator. Come on, somebody. So Revelation chapter 6 through 19. <laughs> some people that have never heard that, oh, my gosh, who's, who's chopping my head off? This church is so weird. Revelation chapter 19 and 20, we're introduced to the second coming of Christ. He ascended from the Mount of Olives. The Bible teaches this, this in the book of Acts. But the Bible says in the book of Revelation that one day he is going to descend onto the Mount of Olives. And every eye on the entire world will see that the man that hung from a rugged cross is none other than the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Every eye will see him. And then in Revelation chapter 20, we see the period of the great white throne judgment. Now I know that during week two, we spoke a little bit about the great white throne judgment and the judgment seat of Christ. There will be two courtrooms that we will present ourselves before the Lord and we, one, we will be judged, and then in the other, we will be rewarded. That's a judgment seat of Christ for what we have done here on earth. And I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about that today. I wanted to open up this teaching talking about that. 
Revelation chapter 20, this is so good, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, the earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. It's recorded in the books. Another book was open, which is the book of life. So today, this is what Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 and 12 is teaching us that will happen. There will be a moment where every person that has ever lived will present themselves before the Lord. So I want you to just see this for what it is. We're talking about billions upon billions of people that have ever lived are going to be in this judgment, right? Now, this is powerful because the Bible says that as part of this process, there will be books, books. And in these books, and I want you to notice this, plural, what do these books show, Pastor? Well, these books are going to show... <laughs> To, are going to show what you have done, what the dead have done according to what was recorded in the books. So in the books, plural, you're going to be able to, the Lord's going to look at it. He's going to say, mm-hmm, yeah, I remember you. <laughs> the year was 1978. Uh-huh. Yeah, you had disco fever. You and your ratchet self, living, living la vida loca, in rebellion to God. Yes, it's there. Yeah, and then, and then you turn 24, and chapter 24 of your life, you continued with your ratchetness. Yeah. Vonnie's definitely going to have a couple chapters in that book. He might have a whole wing of the library dedicated to him. Right. Yeah, my, my life is in that book too. Every one of us are in that book. All my sins, all your sins, all your shortcomings. Every one of us, both the saved and the unsaved, the books, plural, will have a record of what you have done. But then the Bible says right there, Revelation chapter 20, that there is another book. Notice that it's not plural, it's singular. And this book is the one that matters. It is the Lamb's book of life. This is the book that redeems all that you have done and has been recorded in the books. And in the book of life, all that is mentioned and all that the Father will look for is whether or not your name made it to the Lamb's book of life. So, so, so the good thing is that, listen... I know that I've done some horrible things. I know that all of us, we're, we're all here. Come on, somebody. We all made it to this party. We've all had moments where we have been deceitful, that we have walked in our sinful nature, in rebellion to God, in rebellion to the ways of the Lord. But how awesome it is to know that there is a book that there's but one person who can open the book. And that is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And when he calls you and you respond, your name is added to the book. So in that book, book of Lamb's book of life, it'll, 
It was Eli Serrano, redeemed. Levon Claudio, redeemed. So today, I want you to know this. I know you've made it to this book, books. But, but y'all better make sure that you are in this book. Can we just thank God for 30 seconds that God redeemed your story, that God turned it, a lot, turned it around, that he took your mourning and he changed it to dancing, that he took your mess and he put you on solid ground, that there's still power in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody. Come on, give a high five to your neighbor and tell him, I'm in the book. I'm in the book. I'm on that list. I'm in there. I'm in there. There's nothing worse. There's nothing worse than, than you having a, you ever happen to you, you do a reservation for a restaurant. It happened to me on Friday. Candy and I were just running late. We were spending Fridays, our Sabbath. We try to do a date night or do something, spend time with each other. We went and checked out a movie. And then we did dinner plans. And then, you know, by the time we, we I thought we were going to make it there by like 8.15. It was like 8.30. And then I'm, we're late. I call the lady. And she says, don't worry. We'll take you. And then I walked in. I was so embarrassed. It was about 8.40 now. And she looked at me. She gave me that. That mama look, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm, it's you, isn't it? And I'm like, yeah, it's me. She said, come right in. I've been waiting for you. Man, what an awesome feeling it is. What an awesome feeling it is. Oh, that your name is accounted for. Revelation chapter 21 and 22, we deal with the new heavens and the new earth where the Bible says that finally earth will be redeemed. Now, whether you know this or not, earth is still under the curse of what happened in Eden. Mankind, through the power and the work of Jesus Christ, was redeemed. But earth is still under this curse. But the time will come where earth will be redeemed. A new heaven and a new earth. And then we get to Revelation chapter 19, where I opened up this teaching. Verse 7. So then let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. The 3rd of December was one of the happiest days of my life. I got to walk my baby down the aisle and I would love to think that as I look back at her young life and look back at our lives as her mom and dad, that Candy and I, we had been preparing for this moment, but more importantly preparing her for her whole life, through correction, through discipline, through instruction, through affirmation, reminding her of the call of God over her life, loving on her. It was a constant reminder. So much so that I have a black suit, but I wanted to make sure I had a new black suit for that day. I have black shoes, but I wanted to make sure that I had new black shoes that day. It was such a momentous day for me. Walking her down the aisle, so many little details, wanting to make sure that this moment was perfect. Some would even say that I had Bridezilla. That's the rumor. Lies. Lies. <laughs> Lies. Right? But I was so overwhelmed as I, was, as I saw her. I mean, I was, I was standing and uh, sitting down rather by my piano at my house and, and I'm playing and and they're telling me, don't look, don't look, don't look until we tell you to look. I started shaking as I'm there. I'm just so overwhelmed. Finally, they told me to look. I, I gazed at my baby. I started crying. I went up to her. I told her how beautiful she looked. And I, it just got worse. We went inside the limo, we went to the church, and I'm a mess. Listen, I could have used an IV, a Red Bull, a Monster. And some C4. I was a mess. Then I walked her down the aisle and it was so emotional. So, so emotional. Bringing her to her groom. Praying over her. 
uniting their hands, kissing her in the cheek, giving a hug and a kiss to my son-in-law, and then praying over the entire wedding to then step back, sit in the seat, and enjoy this ceremony. But it doesn't end there. After the reception, everything went beautiful. It's been one of the most beautiful days of my life, and she went off into her honeymoon. But I don't stop being dad. I went back home, and I remember just laying back, getting to my house, taking off this same suit, putting it away, sitting in my bed, and it hit me. It hit me. 20 plus years of investing time, energy, and resources, raising up this baby to know Jesus, to love Jesus, to know his ways, to love his word, to love us, to love you as the church. It was a ceremony. It was a, it was a full circle moment for her. It was a full circle moment for her. I, was, I found myself reliving the highlights and the lowlights, the good moments and the bad moments. I saw myself in bed and, and, and I started to weep. I started to weep. I, it was about 30 minutes. I'll be open. I'll be honest with you. 30 minutes of uncontrolled, just crying and crying. My wife looked at me. She said, you better get it together. You got three services tomorrow. Just heartless. Heartless. But can I tell you that that's the way that I feel about pastoring you. For 14 years I have labored and it has been a labor of love. For 14 years I've gone before the Lord studying his word, correcting you, instructing you, encouraging you, rebuking you, disciplining you, loving on you, shaking hands, kissing babies, loving on a community. So when you're doing good, I celebrate you. When you're walking in rebellion, my heart grieves because after all, I feel that it's my responsibility to make sure that you are ready for the wedding. Come on, give your Come on, look at your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, are you ready? 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 So there are two questions that I want to answer today. The first one is, what does it mean to be ready? But then for some of you that have been in church a long time, maybe for you is, the question is a little bit different. The question might be, how do I know that I'm ready? How do I know? And these two questions are answered for us in what's communicated to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. They found themselves in what's a real place today, what is modern-day Turkey. The angel of the Lord gives a message to every one of these churches, and in these messages we find the answer to these two questions. To the church of Ephesus, number one, the message is quite simple. Return to your first love. Allow me to tell you that you are not ready if you've lost your passion. You are not ready if you've lost your zeal. You are not ready if the things that you once did with such conviction have now become secondary things and no longer have the priority that they once had. In the book of Revelation chapter 2 verse 4 and 5, look at the message. Yet I hold this against you. You have Abandoned, forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. For if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now let me tell you something. We could spend an entire sermon talking about what it means to remove the lampstand from your stand. But I will tell you this. It ain't good. It ain't good. To the church of Ephesus, the Lord speaks and says, if you've lost your passion, go back to what you used to do. If there was a moment where you were on fire for the Lord in prayer, in serving, in worship, and for whatever reason, circumstance, offenses, you've lost your way, go back and do the things that you did at first. 
to the second church, the church of Smyrna, the message is remain faithful. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. But be faithful even to the point of death. And I will give you the crown of life. Allow me to tell you that persecution is happening around the world and America has not seen any of it. There are people that are laying down their life in places like China to be able to lift up the name of Jesus. People that are being martyred in the Middle East simply because they have professed Jesus as Lord and as Savior. So when you are persecuted, don't lose sight that God is calling us to remain faithful. Things may not be going your way, but remain faithful. God never promised that, that this walk would be absent of pain. But he did promise that he would always be with you. He would never forsake you. There is a promise for those that endure. They will receive the crown of life. So to you I say, like the message to the church of Smyrna, remain faithful. To the third church, the church of Pergamum, the message is reject doctrinal extremes when we read in verse 14 nevertheless I have a few things against you for you have people there who hold to the teachings of Balaam who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality likewise you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans now, I want you to stay with me because here we are face to face with a lot of the challenges that are happening in the modern church because the teachings of Balaam were this idea, you do, you do, you do, you do, you do whatever you want to do, however you want to do it, live your life however you want to. And God will love you and God will forgive you. That's an extreme and that's a doctrinal error. You will be judged for everything you do. So if you want to do you, you do you. But just know that one day you will go before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's an extreme. That's this, this theology of Balaam. But then there's an opposite extreme and that is the Nicolaitans. Because the Nicolaitans were people that were legalists. They were judgmental towards everybody. Yeah, 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 yeah. They thought that they held exclusivity to salvation. So everybody was destined to doom. And unfortunately, we're seeing this extreme in many churches across America. Where people can't sit across from each other and talk about the things that they have in common. Instead, you have people that look at, look down at you. So you're a pastor, you serve God. Notice that the Bible teaches us to, to completely reject those two extremes. Over the last five years, I have seen how the political climate of our nation has interwoven itself within the fabric of the church. So much so that it's caused a lot of dissension. A lot of division within the body of Christ. And the Bible tells us to avoid those extremes. Jesus lays out the blueprint for the church. It's not the extreme of debauchery, do whatever you want. But it's also not the extreme of being judgmental and casting judgment on everybody. We see this reflected in the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. The Bible says that the law had destined her to die. She was an adulterer. And there they lay with their stones, ready to wail them towards this woman. And Jesus, so powerful, so gifted, so anointed, 
so full of authority, found himself at the front line of this trial. Before him, the people who were holier than thou. But also before him was this woman who was fragmented and caught up in sin. Jesus knelt down. He writes something on the ground. I, I don't know what he wrote. It's one of the questions I'm bringing to heaven. But maybe, maybe he was writing down all the men that had slid into this woman's DM. And all of a sudden, this woman does not hear. She doesn't hear the uproar of the crowd. What she hears is stones that are falling. One by one, stones falling. One by one, she's hearing footsteps. Her face covered with the dirt of the footsteps. Her body overcome with the emotion that she was, she was just seconds away from death. Now she's just overcome with this emotion because she sees the sandals of a rabbi. And then a voice is heard. That voice, simple. The message, clear. Where are those who condemn you? Where are they? At that moment, the woman lifts up her eyes, overcome with the grief of her sin. She starts seeing that there is no one there, just stones, stones. And Jesus looks at her and tells her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus gives us the equation. The equation of the gospel is that it requires grace and truth. Pastor Eli, what do you mean? First, I want you to notice that grace always comes before truth. In my life of being in church, I've learned that truth without grace is mean. But I've also learned that grace without truth is meaningless. So as people that call themselves to be Christ-like, as men and women that communicate the gospel, make sure, make sure that we connect before we correct. Make sure that you build the bridge called grace before you, before you invest time talking about truth. The angel of the Lord challenges the church of Pergamum to reject doctrinal extremes. And then we come across the church of Thyatira. The challenge is simple. Remove impurity. Right there, verse 20 in chapter 2 of Revelation. Nevertheless, I have this against you. That you tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality. And the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Pastor Eli, what does this mean? These are people who have bought into compromise. Stay with me. People who have created God in their image and in their likeness. You have forgotten that you were created in his image and in his likeness, not the other way around. People that have compromised that for them... It's about culture up instead of kingdom down. It's for people who, who make the gospel according, according to their convenience. And here we hear the stern warning of the Lord to remove all impurity. Can I just say something, church? Don't let your theology gravitate towards your behavior. Instead, let your behavior be transformed by the power of sound theology. So sometimes it's going to hurt. Sometimes the Lord's going to prune some stuff. He got to cut it. Before you can grow, he got to cut it. Uh-huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Before the muscle, before you can flex a muscle, you've got to feel the soreness of breaking through what you're used to. 
And God wants to do a new thing in you, but if he's going to do it, you've got to understand that it's kingdom down. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we find the fifth message given to the church of Sardis. And that is renew your purpose. These are the people that started a thing, but they have not finished it. These are the people that got weary and you quit. You quit although you were very close to your breakthrough. You were close to your freedom. You were close to God's miraculous, but you stopped. And to you, the Spirit of the Lord says, renew your purpose. Revelation chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. Look at what it says. It says, wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. So for those of you that are here that you think, well, God is done with me. My best days are behind me. To you I say, God's just getting started, boo. God is not done with you. And I declare in Jesus' name that the latter rain will be greater than the first. You, God is getting ready to use you in a miraculous way. That God is getting ready to promote you. That God is saying, I'm giving you new strength. I don't know who this word is for, but God is saying, I'm giving you new strength. And your, your latter days will be greater than your first days. I, how many people receive that today? You're not done. Come on, look at your neighbor and tell him he's not done with you. Well, pastor, I'm washed up. What good can come out of Holyoke? What good can come out of Springfield? The devil is a liar. What good can come out of New England? The devil is a liar. You are in the palm of God's hand. And then to the church of Philadelphia, the only church of the seven churches that doesn't get a stern rebuke. Instead, it is celebrated. It's celebrated because they revered the Word of God. They held the Word of God to the most optimal place. They revered. They were lovers of the Word of God. They desired the Word of God. To the church of Philadelphia, he encourages them. He tells them, I know that you have little strength. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. This message is for those that have gotten tired, but you have not given up. Yeah, 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 yeah. You've gone through hell, but you've made it out alive and you have not given up. This is for people that have seen death face to face, but you're still standing. The devil hit you with his best shot, but you're still alive. Do I have anybody that can testify? Come on, church. Devil, you try to destroy me. You hit me with your best shot, but I did not stop giving praise to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I may have some battle scars, but I'm still serving Jesus. I might have been delayed, but it's not denied. God has a place for me. I'm still believing God for salvation for my house, although my husband is more rebellious than he's ever been. But I'm continuing. Oh, I'm, I'm preaching to somebody today. Oh, I'm preaching to somebody today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know who this is for, but I came to tell you, don't stop believing. God is getting ready to do something in your house. God is getting ready to do something in your children. God is getting ready to do something in your finances. The devil hit you with, your best, with his best shot, but he didn't knock you down. It's like a good old Rocky movie. 
Remember, we would all watch Rocky get, I'm talking about get the snot beat out of him. Round one, pop, 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 pop. Round two, pop, pop, <laughs> pop, pop. <laughs> Round seven, pop, 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 pop. Round ten. And, and just for, for 14 rounds. Yeah, because in those old days, there used to be 15 rounds. So if you go to the old Rocky movies, he's getting the tar beat out of him for 15 rounds. But with about one minute to go. With about one minute to go, just when the devil thought he had you. Just when the devil thought he was getting ready to put the last nail on your coffin. Just when he thought depression would push you over the edge and you would take your life. Jesus walked in. Jesus walked in. Jesus walked in. So today, we celebrate that if you are a lover of God's word and if you desire his word above all things, God can turn your pain into purpose. You might have some battle scars, but you'll still be standing. Listen, I wish I could tell you that in these years of ministry that my body doesn't have battle scars. My spirit has some scars. My emotions have been wounded. Oh, but I'm here and I'm still standing, still believing God that I will see. I will see. I will see. I will see the hand of the Lord in the land of the living and New England will be known as land of revival and eyes will see and ears will hear that the love of the Lord has come to the shores of New England and you and I get to be a part of that. Come on, look at two people tell them, I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be all right. He hit me with the best shot, but I'm going to be all right. And then probably the most stern rebuke is given to the church of Laodicea, the last church, and the message is quite simple, overwhelming, perplexing, but it's repent from lukewarmness. That's right, repent. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 through 17, I know your deeds. You're neither cold nor hot, but I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. I want you to notice, I want you to notice the church of Laodicea. Because the posture of this church was, well, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing. Is that not the picture of many in today's society? But notice what the Lord tells this church but you do not realize that you are wretched and wretched. I, that, was, that was my version, the, the Eli Holio version. Notice what the Lord says. You're wretched. You're not rich. You're wretched. You, you haven't acquired the right of wealth. You're pitiful. You're, you're not walking in abundance. You're, you're, you're walking in poverty because, because you're poor. Because your heart is broken. Because your soul is fragmented. You're blind and you're naked. You're exposed. That's the message. That's the message to the church of Laodicea. Pastor, what does that have to do with me? Well, listen. If you've ever come to church and you've walked through those doors and you've sat down and you've purpose in your heart. I ain't gonna cry. I ain't, not today. Not today. And then, and then all of a sudden, you start feeling a little tear welled up in your left eye. And you're trying all, you're trying with your with all of your attention to hear. Yeah. 
It's allergies. Somebody's cologne. And then, and then all of a sudden, as the message is going, you feel that God is reading your mail. Like it is God who is revealing himself to you. If you've ever lived the day in your life where you've got money in the bank, you drive the car you want, live in the house you never thought you would live in, you're married, but you wake up and you feel empty, then like the church of Laodicea, you're broken, you're poor because there's something inside of you that only God can fulfill. No sex can fulfill it. No drug can quench it. No house can feel like a home. No relationship can fulfill it. But there is a God who loves you. So what is the, what is the call to action to the churches of Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3? The call to action is found in verse 20. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, the Bible says, here I am. Yeah, yeah, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So this is your Monday application. I got to get up out of here. Number one, number one, hear his voice. Well, Pastor, the Lord's not talking to me. It's not that he's not talking. It's that you have spiritual ADHD. is he talking? He's talking to his word. He's talking through your circumstances. Hear his voice. Number two, what else? No one, what else, Pastor? Number two, open your heart. Notice that he's knocking at the door. He's reading your mail. Open your heart. And then lastly, number three, number three, receive the bread of life. Receive the bread of life. So today, you've heard his voice. It is my heart's plea and prayer that you would open up your heart and that you would eat the bread of life that satisfies all of your needs. If you learned something today, would you stand up to your feet? I want you to give me your undivided attention right where you are. Every eye closed, every head bowed. I believe that the Lord brought you here because he loves you so much. As your pastor, I just want you to be ready for this wedding. All the details. If you're in this room and you don't know Jesus, or perhaps you knew Jesus at one point but something happened. I don't know what happened. What I know is that you're here and he wants to save you. If you're in this room, today is your day to open up your heart. If that is you at the count of three, I want you to lift up your right hand if that's you. Today you're before an audience of one. It's just you and God. Come on, if that's you, one, two, three, is there somebody that says, I need Jesus? God bless you. 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 God bless you.
Church, would you lift up your hands? And the reason we're all lifting up our hands is because after today, we want you to know that you are no longer walking by yourself. That God brought you to a church that loves you. That's going to help you. The Bible says that we confess with our mouth that Christ laid down his life and believed with our hearts that he resurrected on the third day. We too will be saved. So today we're gonna we're gonna confess. We're gonna confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. I want you to repeat this simple prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I know that I've done some wrongs. I also know that you sent your son to the cross of Calvary to lay down his life for my sins. So today I confess Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. Today, I choose life. Today, I choose Christ. Amen and amen. Come on. Amen and amen. What a great time. What a powerful word. Whether you are already a brother or a sister in the faith or you just accepted Christ in your heart today for the first time, I want to invite you to click the link in the description that says, are you new here? So that we can get to know you a little bit, get to know what God is doing in your life and help you identify your next steps. We'll see you here.